and reviewed thousands of pages of loan contracts, lawyers, lawsuits, testimony, and company reports. The people and its documents provide strong evidence that this bank's subprime operations are reaping billions in ill-gotten gains by targeting the consumers who can least afford it. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, and there's one stat that just kind of like boggles when you find out who the bank is. He goes, this bank has established itself as probably the most powerful player in the subprime market by swallowing competitors and employing its vast capital resources and its name brand respectability. This bank, its flagship subprime unit, claims 4.3 million customers and 16,000 plus branches in 48 states, including 350 offices across the South. Things don't stop with this unit, however. The, 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 the web of subprime is woven throughout the bank. This executive's company has refashioned itself into a full-service subprime enterprise, one that makes high-cost loans and sells securities back to... In 2000, one study calculated nearly three of every four mortgages or originated within this lending empire was made by its higher interest subprime affiliates. And there are 180,000 loans out of a total of 240,000. So check it out. The bank is Citigroup. And it's the, at the time the world's largest bank by some measures. Um, and the, this article was written and I, I, it's like I can't even believe it. The summer of 2003. You know, so let's let, you know, let that think in for a second. I have two minutes. And in it, along the way, it says the trend has big risk for banks and their, for banks and their customers. The banking behemoths have gained a reputation for ingenuity at generating growth by tinkering with consumer interest rates and tacking on myriad fees, period, full stop, that's it. And then now back to our show. And, and the thing is, I, you, you, you can't call these stories uncritical or even uninteresting. They actually are interesting. But like I said, I, and I critiqued this thing. I said, this tinkering with rates and tacking on myriad fees packs a lot of bad behavior into a very small space. And the thing uh, is... The distinctive aspect of information of the kind that Anya was mentioning is that it's, we call it, economists call it a public good. Everybody benefits if there's good information, just like everybody benefits from a good government. But because everybody benefits, nobody has an incentive to supply it. So there is inevitably an undersupply of public goods. And so this, in a way, is the fundamental problem of, uh, of getting a supply of disinterested good information about uh, our economy, about society, about anything. There are strong private incentives for distorted information. So th there are strong incentives, incentives if you have a political agenda to get information out about why it is that the stimulus is not going to work, even if it's not true. Uh, advertisers have an incentive to get out information about why, uh, you know, taking out a 30% interest rate mortgage is a good idea and you'll enjoy it. Uh, if you're supplying information and it's being financed by advertisers, you have to be a little bit tame to the advertisers. You have to be, say, sensitive to their concerns. So if, the, uh, if, if one of your major advertisers are the banks, you're not likely to say that the banks are engaged in corruption and, and exploitation and, and all those things. And so in a way, the basic business model of, of news delivery in the United States for a very long time was uh, inherently biased. There's another problem, uh, though, for, for most media, uh, they're competitive, but being competitive means that you succeed by access, to access to stories. And who has the information? Well, typically, you, if you started thinking about what are the, who, who has the information, people usually who have the information have an incentive for you to have a, tell their story in a particular way. But then you start looking, if you follow this uh, closely over time, you then begin to understand that some reporters are owned by certain people in the administration. Uh, they wouldn't call it that, but that's really a, a more accurate description of what was going on. And this is true in almost most of the media, very true in the New York Times, I saw very, very clearly that 
that there were certain reporters uh, that you knew who they were talking to all the time. And then if you had any doubts about this, what we call uh, exchange, you would see episodically a, um, a puff piece, we call them, uh, telling, glorifying the hero of the leaker. Uh, the guy who's giving the information would be uh, uh, described in one article or another as really the brains behind the administration or the strong man in the administration, the guy who was the bringing on the idea. So it was a very clear, uh, uh, it was not only that his ideas were being pushed, but his, personal, his, his person was being pushed. So this is really an essential nature of, of the media. Now in business journalism, it's even worse because you're not gonna get access to uh, the business other than their press release if you don't treat them well. Um, essentially, uh, even if exposed to be public, it's privatized. And therefore, you, you, you have an exchange of that private information to somebody else to make it public, but then you, you distort it. Well, uh, in uh, the crisis, this particular crisis, things were more, com there, uh, more coverage was, uh, to the, this, these problems I've just described, there was one more problem, which was the banks worked extraordinarily high, hard to make sure that no one knew what was going on. So they engaged in activities that were trying to make sure that the regulators, the investors, the shareholders didn't know what was going on. Because if they did know what was going on, they wouldn't be allowed. So with such active engagement in non-transparency, it's not surprising that it was very difficult for the, for the media to, to uncover it because, you know, as I say, it was not an accident that it was not transparent. What I found so amusing is some of the players, major players in this non-transparency were those who had been critical of East Asia for being non-transparent. The writer or the newscaster wants people to listen. So think about the people, what people want to listen to. Do people want to be told that they just made the worst mistake of their life in buying these things that are going to break? Or would they rather hear, boy, are you smart? And so there's a really natural tendency for the listeners to want to hear good news. They don't want to hear bad news. So if you present good news, you just told people who bought stock they're going to make a lot of money, they're going to listen to you. And if you have a market-based model of listeners, mm -hmm. you're gonna do better. And your boss is gonna give you higher pay and going to give you more attention. So the market model really in this context has some really mm -hmm. fundamental problems that even if journalists wanted to accurately describe what was going on, he would f might find himself without readers. Um, and it says, if a bank is too big to fail, is it not too big to remain a private profit making, i.e. Uh, nationalize these banks instead of bailing them out. Well, what I want to point about here is how language uh, has played a very big role, and that's true in a lot of the of the discussion. And and again, the media needs to be a little bit more active in thinking about the language. So, the word nationalization has certain connotations in the United States. If they used another word that actually is just as descriptive, which is ordinary rules, conservatorship, or 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 bankruptcy, or you know. All of these are usual procedures when you can't pay your creditors, you're, stop, you're supposed to shut down the institution. And then something happens. You have Chapter 11, and banks, we have a, a procedure that's like Chapter 11 or like bankruptcy, we just call it a conservatorship. If they had used that word, and we would have realized that we were actually suspending the rules of capitalism when we bailed them out. And, and that is a different way of characterizing the, thing, the same thing. But the advisors of Obama wanted this to be characterized as nationalization because that way the choice was between acting like uh, 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 one of those Scandinavian countries uh, which actually managed their bailout, their, their restructuring of their bank very well and, and their bank and the economy recovered and the United States, which managed it extraordinarily badly, and we have still not 
uh, recovered. In the aftermath of the crisis uh, in Europe, there was a lot of discussion of uh, a new capitalism, a lot of discussion about something was wrong with the market model. And we need to think about the rules of the game. And this was, and actually the political leaders, uh, people like Sarkozy on the right, talked about that the crisis showed that something was wrong with the way our system worked. Uh, and that was not meant to be a, a uh, statement that we ought to move away from a market economy, but it was a statement that the rules, the current rules, the way we run today are not ideal. And we ought to be thinking about fundamental reforms. What's so interesting is that has not happened in the United States. And the press has not really taken an active role in, in, in saying, you know, uh, something went wrong. And the rules of the game are really, there's something peculiar about the way we run uh, our economy. So uh, this is a deeper point. It goes to the basic pre premises of Freemanite economics. Uh, it goes to the premises of how uh, economies function. And that discussion of what are the bases of well-functioning economies, I think uh, ought to uh, still be discussed. <laughs> because uh, obviously the economy is not back uh, working like it should. And the final interesting question, there are lots of interesting questions, the final one is, so the conflicts of interest that we all have, the question says, because most of us have a substantial amount of our money in stocks, not, most of us is actually not true, 50% of Americans have no financial assets, but uh, probably most of the people here probably do. Anyway, most of, uh, uh, and they often indirectly do through pension funds, which they're not really fully aware of. Doesn't uh, that make many of us environmental advocates ambivalent about attacking corporations that are both polluting and providing us without retirement funds? Um, well, I think it does illustrate the, the uh, uh, mixed roles that all of us as citizens uh, are in. And that, uh, fortunately, I think most of us really do separate our, our rule, uh, uh, separate our roles, and even if we have pension funds that own BP, or even if we have uh, 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 our adversely affected privately, we understand, try to separate out our role as citizens. But the interesting thing, again, from the press, was the coverage of the BP spill in the UK versus the United States. Because BP is the largest corporation, about 10%, I think, of the uh, cap uh, of, of the capitalization stock market in, in the UK, and they took a very defensive role interpretation of the BP spill. So this issue of, of, of interest is always going to be there even when it's not just the company itself. Uh, as